Hello, and you're very welcome to episode 68 of The Fifth Court, a podcast on legal affairs presented by myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. Myself, Mark Tottenham Barrister and editor of Decisis Law Reports. Mark, as you will recall, we had a fascinating discussion last week about drink driving, drug driving with Barrister Michael Daly, who has written an incredible book on the subject. Mm. And And uh, knows it from both sides. And knows it from both sides and has no bother being a former guard there, practising for 37 years. Gamekeeper turned Oh yeah, Yeah. good for him. Good for him. Uh, No, it was a really brilliant interview and I got a lot of reaction to that during the week. Lots of information in that interview. It was really, really good. Well, today we are delighted to be joined by solicitor Paul Egan, who is a partner in Mason, Hayes and Curran. Paul has had a stellar career and is one of the originals of the species, being one of the first solicitors to be appointed senior counsel, I think, in 2020. Yeah, the very first batch. Yeah, yeah which is fantastic. And he's also chair of the Statutory and Company Law Review Group, which advises the Minister for Enterprise. And he has done so much. And he also recently won a prize, Mark. He did. Uh, did you, were you there for that prize I giving think, ceremony? I think, was that the Dublin Solicitors Bar Association? Oh, yeah. I think somebody yeah. else got an award there, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, he he, a very worthy winner for his book on Irish securities law. Mm. Uh, fantastic and, book. And a couple of other less worthy winners. Less present worthy there, winners, yeah, but yeah, sure, we all, had, we, we all had a good knees up. We That's the most did, important yeah. thing. Yeah. But anyway, we'll be back to him shortly. But first to three cases that you have identified from the Decisis website. And we start with criminal a criminal judicial review arising out of the fact that the accused had not signed a bond in respect of a suspended sentence. I'm not sure what the the offence was in this case. You're no no doubt going to tell me. This is the case of Redmond versus the Director of Public Prosecutions. And it's a decision of Ms. Justice Marguerite Bulger. Yeah, so the offence was for criminal damage and there was a suspended one month prison sentence. But a requirement of a suspended sentence is that you sign a bond. And the offender in this case left court without signing the bond. The judge had said to him before he left, you need to sign the bond, but he left anyway. And when he came back the next day to sign it, the judge said, no, you're too late. You should have signed it yesterday. And so the suggestion was he should be brought straight to jail. And so they brought a judicial review and Ms. Justice Bulger said, no, the judge did not lose jurisdiction during the 24 hours or whatever it was, that it was not too late for him to sign the bond. So so, so that was a bit over strict. So she she said that he, he was entitled to sign the bonds the next day and shouldn't have been imprisoned. OK, very interesting, Mark. Well, next to a case concerning whether a judgment in a family law dispute, which of course had been heard in camera, could be disclosed in subsequent bankruptcy proceedings and in a case that also came before the Workplace Relations Commission, and this was deemed to be in the interest of the children and the mother. This is the case of D versus D, and it's the decision of Mr Justice Max Barrett. Yeah, now this is a very involved case, but essentially what happened was that the husband in this case, in where, as you said, family law proceedings were in being, there were children of the marriage, minor children, but the husband was involved in bankruptcy proceedings in another country. And the wife clearly had some involvement there and wanted to disclose some of the information from the family law proceedings, um, which, as you say, not only are the proceedings themselves in camera, but anything to do with the proceedings should not be published or disclosed to a third party. However, you can make an application to the court, as they did in this case. And the wife wanted to be able to say in the bankruptcy proceedings what had gone on. And as Mr Justice Barrett rightly said, once the husband was made bankrupt, there was a real chance that he would be coming back to Ireland to argue for a change in the maintenance he had to pay. So it made sense for there to be a a bit of interaction between the proceedings in Ireland and the bankruptcy proceedings elsewhere. And then also, as you say, there was a a similar issue in the Workplace Relations Commission. Okay, very good. So in the interest of justice, you can disclose information that would not normally be disclosed? If the court gives you permission, you have to make the application to the court. Okay, fascinating case. And finally, to a planning case which held that the grant of permission for a strategic housing development was not in accordance with law, and this is the case of Malloy versus Onboard Planola, and it's a High Court decision of Mr. Justice David Holland. Yeah, this is, I mean, there have been a number of these challenges to strategic housing developments, and there's been a lot of commentary in the press. I mean, I saw David McWilliams criticising the judicial review procedures in Ireland. But what seems to happen with a lot of these cases is that Onboard Planola have simply taken the view that because there is a need for housing, that they're simply going to allow some of these permissions to go through. And 
One of the particular requirements for this particular development was that the that the site was well served by what the phrase they use is high capacity public transport. And it seemed clear from the inspector's reports that there was not sufficient high capacity public transport at the time of the application, although there were plans to improve the Lewis service to this particular area. And what the judge said was, it is quite clear that the requirement is that there is currently sufficient public transport provision. And I think the general concern is that on Bodplanola, I mean, this has come up in a few cases, that they, they use the phrase strategic housing development to allow developments that don't comply with the requirements in other respects. So they're building up problems for the future by allowing certain developments. And so that, so anyway, it's the particular, the public transport issue was the, the reason okay. for the JR so, in this So case. our general anxiety in Ireland to build more houses every now and again it's coming unstuck when it goes before the courts because they're not complying with the planning legislation. Well, exactly. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's all very well to say people need somewhere to live, yeah, but, but if you then find property. that they can't, that, that, that there's no way for them to get into work, I mean, the, you know, our streets are already jammed. Our, our, the, certainly their public transport is often very full. So I think that there are other issues that we need to concern ourselves okay. with. Okay, thank you for those, Mark. Uh, really well explained. So back shortly with Mr. Paul Egan, solicitor with Mason Hayes and Curry. Silence in the fifth court. So we are very pleased to be joined today in the studio by Paul Egan, senior counsel, who is a senior consultant and former chairman of the corporate law division of Mason Hayes and Curran. But I see, Paul, from your LinkedIn page that from 1976 to 1978, you were a musician and arranger with the Abbey Theatre. And I gather you also have some music composing experience. Can you tell us a little bit about your life before the law? Sure. Actually, my father was a solicitor, although he spent most of his life trying to encourage me not to become a solicitor. And partly on account of that, I didn't study law in university. I went to Trinity and studied history and political science. And when I was in Trinity, one of the uh, peculiarities of the time was that there were no exams in June. They were took place in September. And that meant that you could... Uh, Enjoy your, enjoy, your, enjoy your summer term and have a terrific time. So I got very deeply involved with Dublin University Players, the Drama Society. Mm. And in my fourth year, I was uh, hired into the Peacock Theatre first to perform and compose some music for Manus and the Mighty Dragon, which is a play for children by Lady Gregory. Wow. And uh, as soon as I was there on site, uh, when they needed a piano player or an arranger or a guitar player, I was the guy they went to. So I performed in Dennis Johnson's The Old Lady Says No, wrote music for Measure for Measure, right. and uh, wrote music for Sean O'Casey's Cockadoodle Dandy. And th that was me uh, in my final year and uh, the year after that. And you wow. gave up the riches of show business to become an impoverished lawyer. Uh, that is it. And I, uh, I spent half a year across in Paris studying French language. And when I came back, I was just determined that I would become a lawyer. I just got terribly curious. It arose when you'd be in conversation with people and they'd say, do you know what they can do if you do such and such? And I wanted to know who they were and what the such and such was. Can, can I jump in here? And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, to, I'm loath to get in at this stage, but I'm very excited about this theatrical background, Paul. Uh, I didn't know that about you. And we've had a couple of guests on this show who've had kind of kind of followed both those paths. We had Deirdre Murphy, retired High Court judge, who almost went full time into the Oscar Theatre, which used to be down there in Sandymount, wasn't of that course, it? Of course, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we also had Colm O'Dwyer, who Mark told me both of them starred with uh, Dominic West in Players all those years ago. You're going to have to tell us a bit more about this. So you were a student and you were composing music in the Abbey. So had you an instrument or... How were you composing? What, what well, was your background in well, relation to this? What happened was that uh, I played in a number of dance bands and I formed uh, a very large band to perform music by an English composer, Mike Oldfield, who had had a... Tubular uh, Bells. bells. Yeah. Tubular Bells. <laughs> so uh, we were, in fact, the third ever band to perform Tubular Bells ever in the world and the first ever to, to perform another work of his called Amadon. And uh, at one stage, there were 26 of us in it. And we had quite an eclectic gathering of musicians. And, and, and sorry, where were you performing this? In, in dance halls uh, uh, or in... Well, we performed in Trinity. We performed mm. in the exam hall. We had a residency out in what was then called the South County Hotel. Mm. And uh, we played in various schools as well. But uh, 
And fact, Amadan uh, is what we all understand it to mean. It's, it is. I yeah. see. Yeah, right. It yeah. is. It's, yeah. uh, so, well, I'm, I'm thinking of the 70s. I'm thinking of the rats, the Boomtown rats. Were you kind of, you know, were you taking them on in, in the uh, Dublin of those days? Even a young Phil Linnet was all the rage, wasn't he? Tim Lizzie. I'm uh, getting very excited about this, Paul, I have to say. Uh, they were. I think uh, one of the bands I was in, we used to perform music by those uh, bands, but no, we were never uh, serious contenders. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So, uh, well, unfortunately, I, I, this being a legal affairs <laughs> one, okay, and tempting can, though it is. You're allowed to go on to the law. You're allowed to go <laughs> um, on to the law, Mark. Uh, you, you rebelled against your father's wishes and decided to follow him down the the route of becoming a solicitor. And I think you've your your entire career you've been with Mason Hayes and Curran. Is that yeah, right? Uh, my, uh, I was just reflecting a little bit on that. I'm actually 46 years in Mason wow. Hayes and Curran and. Mason Hayes and Curran has been in existence under that name for 54 years. So uh, I went in as an apprentice, as they call it, in 1978. And I was apprenticed to Morris Curran, the Curran of Mason Hayes and Curran. And I was trained by Dermot Mason, uh, qualifying in 1981. And I immediately became the assistant solicitor to Morris Curran, who was a formidable intellectual. Subsequently, he became president of the Law Society. He was a government inspector first inspector under the 1990 Companies Act. He looked into the, the Green Corps affair. And uh, he used to joke that uh, he didn't delegate, he only abandoned. Hmm. So in the first few years, I did everything. I did family law, I did a bit of criminal law, landlord and tenant litigation sorry, what, at Circuit Court. What was the company like, the, the firm like at that stage? I mean, was it? A, it's now a big sort of corporate law firm with sort of uh, impressive offices there on Barrow Street. But yeah. in those days, was it a kind of smaller affair? It was. There were 12 solicitors when I yeah. joined and uh, we were in two adjoining buildings on Fitzwilliam Square. And although there were 12 solicitors, really a number of those solicitors ran their own private practices, as it were, and everybody yeah. did everything. And it was only after a few years that people began to specialise. But I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to do a very broad type yeah. of work. And I think now when young solicitors are being trained, sometimes they can get into specialization maybe a little bit too soon. And I mean, even at this stage, I would, if a client wanted it, write a will for them because yeah. uh, that's a very important skill that I think all solicitors need to have. But I began specializing in the middle of the 1980s and that's what got me into securities law. Morris Kern, who was a great business getter, uh, he wasn't terribly troubled by getting into the details of uh, securities law, but I was a complete geek hmm. and I really wanted to get into it. So and I should probably just stop and say one of the reasons that you're on the show is because you've recently uh, published, is it the second edition of your book on securities law? No, oh, it's uh, the first ever. The, the book is Irish Securities Law hmm. uh, and that was published in 2021. Right. Prior to this, for the last 20 years, Mason Hayes and Curran has produced annotated compendia Mm. of European securities law. And it's it's highly complex and it's great yeah. fun. And, and just to, for, for listeners who aren't entirely clear, when we use the term securities law, we're talking about tradable stocks, shares, bonds, commodities, that kind of thing. Is yeah. That correct? Well, securities law is primarily concerned with actually the information that needs to be produced when securities are being sold to the public, information that companies need to put out uh, on the market to make sure that the market is fully informed. It's to do with making sure that people who have inside information don't mm. deal in shares. And it, it's to deal with all of the related governance that and, applies. And in, I mean, I was just looking at the, the, the chapter headings in your book. I mean, you, you, you list phrases most of us wouldn't be familiar with, like the prospectus regime, the listing regime, market abuse and transparency regime. And it, basically, prospectus is when you're launching a new product, isn't that right? Or it a new is, share. Yeah. If there's and it's an the information you have to give people who want to buy it. That's right. So that's uh, European law with Irish law and procedure and layered on top of it. So that's what prospectuses are. And prospectuses are monster documents now. Mm. And one of my great regrets is that part of the reason why there aren't as many companies coming to the markets in Ireland and certainly we hear about it in the United Kingdom as well, is that there has been a multiplication of the technical requirements that are needed when you launch shares to the public. In the past, what happened was you would write maybe a 30-page prospectus and it said, we make widgets, our risks are P 
people won't buy our widgets or our widgets are defective. Mm. Now you have to put in pages and pages of risk factors. Yeah, and Paul, this is this is really interesting. And congratulations on the book, which is fantastic. Mm. Really, re- 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 really excellent. And I notice you, you've always been very good. You, you give talks and I know there was a recent conference the Corporate Enforcement Authority gave and you were very much centre stage in relation to that. And can we just talk about the evolution of securities law? I mean, we had Ian Drennan of the Corporate Enforcement Authority and he talked about how back in the, the 1990s and early noughties, there was concerns about the fact that even though there was a requirement on companies to behave in a certain way, maybe that wasn't being policed as well as it should be by the state. What about securities law? Was that was that was there was there kind of gaps, lacuna lacunae in, in, in that area, or did it need more supervision? I, I think certainly there there were lacunae, not so much when it came to the information that would be in prospectuses, because I don't believe that there have been any actual prospectus actions where there have been legal proceedings, you know, criminal, civil and administrative has been under what's called the market abuse regime. And this market abuse regime is part of securities law and it's the area where practitioners probably spend most time. Is this what we call insurgent trading? It is, yeah. It's to do with individuals or companies uh, who abuse information because they have information that the market doesn't have. Or it's companies failing to keep the market appraised of information that should be out there, which is material to their share price. So, so just to go back to the prospectus, what you're basically saying is that w- that they were fixing a problem that didn't exist. They they're now making huge requirements of companies who want to launch on the stock exchange or release bonds to provide information that really the the market doesn't need. I would argue that that's the case. I think it's gone over the top, and certainly a lot of times when solicitors are acting for companies that are trying to raise money, what you're trying to do is to avoid the requirements of the prospectus directive. I mean, it's fine if you're you know, Shell, BP, or, you know, some monster company where the costs of raising money are a kind of a rounding error. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a a company with a market value of, say, 50 million euros or 100 million euros, um, the costs of raising money can be a real disincentive. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, is it really, you know, a, a solution to a problem that didn't exist? Like, I mean... You know, nowadays we're hearing more and more about the the central bank getting involved. Maybe I'm slightly on the wrong track here, Paul, but I don't know whether I am. You know, there have been investigations. There have been very large fines levelled against people who are trading in shares, etc. Yep. You know, now maybe it's slightly different to the prospectus when a, an IPO is happening, etc. But I mean, are we not hearing now kind of, you know, at this stage that there were a lot of problems out there and well-established firms in the way they went out about their business? Uh, weren't always doing things to the letter of the law. Uh, (laughs) Well, maybe they did it to the letter of the law uh, and the law wasn't good enough. But uh, when it comes to insider dealing, there are, in fact, only four cases that have ever made it into a court or into a procedure. In Ireland. uh, In Ireland. Uh, Two criminal prosecutions and there was one acquittal and one conviction on a guilty plea recently. One administrative uh, sanction that was published two years ago. And and of course, the big civil action was Fife's against DCC. Yes. But it must be very difficult to um, to police. I mean, with the, these days, with the amount of information people are able to pass in new, using numerous channels, how can you possibly keep an eye on all of the information that well, people are? I, I think the, the integrity of the securities market depends hugely on companies making sure that information is put out in a timely fashion. Uh, if that happens, so the theory goes, if all information which is likely to affect the price of shares is put out by a company, well, then there's no inside information on which uh, people can deal in. There's a fascinating matrix of technical uh, rules, which if we have a couple of hours, I'll uh, gladly take everybody through. That, 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 that'll be the, 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 the private can, can, CPT. Can we, uh, can we go back to Fives and DCC? It was such a colossal case. Will you tell us a little bit about that, Paul? Right. Well, as well as writing about this case uh, in the book, I've also written a detailed article about this for the Irish jurist. So uh, what happened was that DCC, through various uh, intermediate companies, held shares in Fife's. The chief executive of DCC was a non-executive director. This is Jim Flavin. This is Jim Flavin. And the share price of Fife's began to uh, rise on the back of the 
first internet boom, the dot-com boom. And it became pretty clear that the share price of Fife's had nothing at all to do with its underlying trade. And it had everything to do with the the dot-com boom because uh, Fife's had decided to set up uh, worldoffruit.com. It was a, a portal for trading in fruit. Anyway, what then happened was that DCC wished to sell their shares and they sold their shares and it was held ultimately by the Supreme Court that that trade had been done when there was unpublished price sensitive information. However, I think that that ultimate ruling has been heavily criticised. In my article, I make the point that the verdict would have been absolutely different under the current law. If you consider this, Four days before the trade in shares took place, the chairman of Fife's wrote in his annual report that he looked forward to a further year of growth. So there was great celebrations when yes. DCC offloaded their shares. So if I have my post or my communion money and I think, you know what, I wouldn't mind doubling that, that's an incentive to invest, isn't it? May you well be. Yes. You might think that. I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment. But uh, So what then happened was, on the day of the AGM, a profit warning was announced on the basis that the underlying trade in Fife's, which nobody considered to have any bearing on the share price, uh, it was announced and the share price started to tank after that. I think it was 18 months later that it was decided that uh, Fife's, using a right of action that existed mm. under the um, then law, were able to seek a recovery from DCC of the profits that they had made on the sale of shares. Now, there's an encyclopedic ruling of Justice uh, Lefoy in the High Court, which I would say that most securities lawyers look to as being the definitive statement of the law. What an absolutely brilliant judge. Brilliant. What a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant judge. And then uh, it went to appeal in the uh, Supreme Court and uh, the Supreme Court reversed the ruling of the High Court. Okay. And look, that's a, uh, thank you for that. That's a brilliant explanation of what was a huge case. And I mean, a case that filled uh, the legal pages, but the business pages for so long. Um, yes. I remember when it, was, when it was taking place. And you said, though, that the law has changed since. So how has the law changed since? Well, if there is insider dealing now, the contravention is the use of the information. Whereas under the previous law, it was effectively in no fault if you dealt at a time when you were objectively in possession of the information subsequently determined to be inside information. Okay. uh, You would be uh, guilty of a contravention. Okay. So so the law is less stringent now. Is that my reading of it? Well, I I think that it's less... There has to be a kind of a deliberate attempt on the part of of whoever it is to to use that information in a certain way. Yeah. It's less capricious. Candidly, the old law was, in my view, quite unfair. Yeah. Because if you have... You just had the information, you know, and then suddenly you were guilty as charged. That's it. And even though it was absolutely clear that none of the parties involved ever considered the information to have a bearing on their conduct at the time. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we, we we jumped r- rather straight from you. You were to- talking about the background space in Hayes and Curran, and we w- went mm. straight into your securities law. I'd just like to go back a little bit to your career there in in the, the firm. So from basically from the early 1980s, you said that the, the firm became more and more a sort of commercial firm, moved away from the kind of the old-fashioned Fitzwilliam Square type offices. Is it a very different environment now than you? Oh, it is. Uh, I mean, the, the firm, as I say, when I joined, had 12 solicitors. Mm. We now have, I think, over 320 solicitors. And is the uh, legal environment very different then? In- it is. What's happened is that there are areas of law, such as securities law, but for example, such as privacy law, yeah. which have become hugely important in view of the fact that the big data companies like Google and Meta and uh, Microsoft and all the other internetish companies are based here. And, that, and because under European law, the regulation takes place in a designated member state, Mason and Curran and other large law firms haven't necessarily had to bulk up in order to be able to service. And you're situated right beside the Google offices there, aren't you? We are. Which must yes. be very convenient <laughs> for some people. <laughs> um, and in terms of the kind of the work that you're doing, I mean, do you have people effectively who, who are on call 24 hours a day for the kind of, you know, you're, you're dealing with companies that are, have their head offices in states that are operating in other parts of Europe, the Middle East and Africa, 
and you're that you're you're advising them on you know it's 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 a very different world isn't it from corporate law in the 1980s it is what i would say is that well we have uh, an office in london at the moment but we also have one in san francisco and a representative office in new york but ireland is a very open economy and my firm along with all of the um, corporate law firms need to be on call and you know certainly in my younger years i used to you know working through the night was reasonably routine. It just had to be done. That had to be done. That's it. And we did it out of necessity, not because we needed to brag about it. how were you at half five in the morning (laughs) when you were typing up that contract? (laughs) (laughs) Ah, sure, it was great fun altogether. Yes, of course. You know, sometimes it just needed to be done uh, in order for transactions uh, to go ahead. I used to say that every closing meeting needed to have 20 hours set aside because there were just so many little micro steps that needed to be uh, done, you know. Companies take overs or share issues or what have you. And then in the last few years, you became, I think, a consultant rather than a solicitor, the, than a partner with the firm. That's right. And then you took Silk. I, were you one of the first solicitor senior counsel? Uh, I, I was, yes. I was, yeah. in, I was mm-hmm. in the first cohort. A change in the law in 2015, which came into effect in 2020, allowed solicitors to apply to become senior counsel. Now, I think strictly speaking, solicitors were always entitled to apply, but the criteria for appointment prior to the change in the law was expertise in advocacy or expertise in a particular area of litigation. So a third criterion was put in, which was specialisation in an area of law. So I applied on the basis of my company law and securities law competence and specialisation. And I was fortunate to get it. I was very glad of it. And so does, you were one of the, the pioneers, uh, Paul. I mean, you were one of the first to, to be made senior counsel. Alan Shatter was very much a, a promoter of that, wasn't he, when you were mis- Minister for Justice? He was. Of course, he was an advocate. And he had. did, did he have run-ins with the bar council where he sought to lead uh, junior counsel in court? Yes. And, yeah, well, I mean, he was, a, <laughs> I have to say, he was a man who had a command of words and was a, a very and impressive... And still has. And still has, of course, absolutely. Still yes. has and was always imp- very impressive on his feet, as us barristers like to, like to talk about, as no doubt you are yourself. Can I ask you, 46 years mm. with the mothership, I yeah. mean, like, you know, you're at the very top, Paul, and you have been for a very long time. You know, the desire to represent, to give advice, you've produced this incredible book. I mean, this is such a weighty tome the work that you've put into it, you know, the, the, the desire to, to, to represent and to, you know, clients come knocking on your door and you're dying to open that door and talk to them and advise. Well, yeah, uh, I think that, first of all, I think it's a good idea for solicitors to exit the partnership at a particular stage. I don't okay. think it's a good idea that they stay in the partnership forever and ever. And why is that? Because, first of all, it's undeniable that somebody who's in their 60s is going to objectively have less energy than somebody in their 30s. But there's also the fact that for a firm to grow and to prosper, you need to make sure that there's a good career path there for junior solicitors, that they can aspire to be partners and that there aren't blockers there who will stay there forever. Also, I'm a member of the Council of the Law Society. Yes. I chair the Company Law Review Group. And I think that it's far more compatible to be out of the partnership having a little bit of extra time and also to have time for authorship. But I still have a clientele. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that I'm delighted to keep on working. I mean, a number of former partners in the firm, I mean, some have gone into you know, full retirement, but others have reinvented themselves as leading directors, leading non-executive directors on large and public companies. And they're just as busy as I am, but, but I, in a different... I, I can understand, I mean, to a certain extent, as you say, kind of, you know, the, the notion of making space for people to kind of promote and have careers. Yeah. And I can also understand if you're doing all-nighters, which are required on, on occasion, etc., that maybe it's a, it's a, I was going to say a young man's game, a young person's game sometimes, okay? Mm-hmm. But the wealth of experience, I mean, I would have thought that that's what's invaluable. I mean... Well, all the experience over the years. Look at all the firms you've dealt with, all the, the the issues that you've advised on. I mean, there's not a lot now that'll surprise you at this stage. You know, that's right. But the great advantage is that I'm able to consult into that. Yes. And assist the brilliant lawyers that we have. The ones who are pulling the all-nighters. Yes, indeed. 
just another thing while we're here. You, you've, as you said, you ch- you chair the 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 um, the law review group, the statutory law review group, and as a result, you have a direct line to the Department of Enterprise. Isn't that correct? And that you've, is you've right. had that. That I think that's something that's very important to you. That's right. The, the company law review group was set up in the year two thousand, and it was the brainchild of Michael McDool when he was then either Attorney General or Minister for Justice, and Tom Courtney, uh, Dr. Tom Courtney. and Famous author on company law. He is. Uh, so he was the chair of the company law review group for 18 years. And uh, he's a really tough act to follow. He set really, really high standards. And he's a great friend. And I you know, applaud everything that he's done. I applied to be chair of the review group if, but only if, Tom was not going to go ahead in 2018 when they introduced uh, more procedures. So I've chaired it since uh, 2018 and it's a terrific body. And in fact, it's been copied now. There's an employment law review group, which is about to be set up on a statutory basis. And what it does is it gathers together all the stakeholders of company law. You've got lawyers, accountants, company secretaries, civic societies groups such as you know, IBEC, IG2, ISME, state bodies, obviously the Corporate Enforcement Authority, the Attorney General's Office. And what it does is it sort of road tests uh, ideas for company law. It was the Company Law Review Group which produced the what became the Companies Act of 2014. Okay. So we report on an ad hoc basis to the minister and our reports are then published once a, once a year. And uh, it's had an impact, hasn't it? Oh, it has. I mean, if you think of it, when COVID happened, we mobilised immediately. In fact, uh, Tom Courtney and myself and a couple of others uh, on the Company Law Review Group very quickly got together to design solutions to the fact that company meetings couldn't take place anymore. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, the Companies Act requires annual general meetings to take place, you know, subject to exceptions. But how was that law going to be complied with in COVID? What about the company seal? If the company seal is in Dublin and one director is in Donegal and one director is in Cork Mm -hmm. and documents need to be executed, how are you going to do that? Yes. So we came up with solutions and in August of that year, an amending companies bill was passed. Okay, very, very interesting. And and what I found interesting there was like, you know, the genesis of this seems to have been when one Michael McDool was in office as Minister for Justice or Attorney General? Well, th- there was what's called the uh, the McDool Report on Company Law. Okay. Which came out in 1998. 1998. Okay, so he was then probably that just a member of the... Pro- the yeah, the pro- yeah, a member of the Progressive Democrats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But no, but, but before, I, we talked about the, the Corporate Enforcement Authority and he was one of the people who led to the, the office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement, That's which right. was there first. The, the the corporate enforcement authority. You know, how do you view that? I know, as I said, you participated in that conference. It's a new development. It's a new supervisory body for you know companies out there. It keeps an eye on everything. It stands alone now. It's kind of it's separate mm. from a government department. Is that a good thing? I think it's excellent. I think it's not only the fact that they they enforce not by coming along and punishing people who misbehave, but what they do. They have an advocacy role as well, and they produce. Terrific information for company stakeholders, you know, for company directors, for shareholders, for company secretaries. Uh, they provide guidance. I mean, on, in its prior existence of the ODCE, they did this, but they ran that conference to focus on uh, enforcement issues and uh, topical issues. And I think the fact that we have a regulator out there, I mean, the, the best advertisement for any organization is good regulation. So the best advertisement for propriety in company law is um, good regulation of the corporate right. world. Well, we could talk about all of these issues and more, but uh, unfortunately our time is coming to an end. But we have a question that we have to ask you, Paul. Uh, do you have either a book or a film or maybe both that you'd like to recommend to the listeners of The Fifth Court? Well, c- can I have two books, please? You can, of course. Okay, the first is Barbarians at the Gate by Burroughs and Hellier. And this is about the leverage buyout of RJR Nabisco. Okay. And, and it's, this is not a novel. It's a, it's a, no, it's a, it's it's a, a true fact, story. Right. Bar- and Barbarians it, at the Gate. Okay. Barbarians at the Gate. Right. And it's so good that my late mother, who right. was not a lawyer, but she read it twice and right. she adored it. Fantastic. It's a great whodunit. Okay. Uh, the second book is a more recent one, uh, Servants of the Damned by David Enrich. And it tells the story of Jones Day, 
the uh, Cleveland, Ohio law firm. Why is it called Servants of the Damned? Uh, they're the law firm that represents Donald Trump. Fantastic. And it tells their story as a, a campaigning uh, law firm in Ohio and how they have meandered into a different space. See. Hey. <laughs> and what about the movie? There's only Did, one. No, there's only one. Rogue Trader. Uh, I would, you're close. It's, uh, <laughs> Nick Leeson in all his glory. <laughs> Wall Street. Oh, Wall Street. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Give us the line. Lunch is for... Wimps. Wimps, absolutely. Great. Okay. So, Paul Egan, thank you very much for joining us here in the Fifth Court. The Fifth Court will adjourn until next week. So that's all from this edition of the Fifth Court. We hope you have enjoyed it. Can we say a huge thank you to Paul Egan for coming in and discussing his book on securities law and his wonderful past as a composer and as a musician. Performer and um, tubular bells. And I can let our listeners into a little secret. As he left, he very kindly gave us a copy of one of his CDs. Yeah, the, the which Liffey I am Light looking Orchestra. Forward to. Is that'll, his... be pl- that'll be played on the way home Certainly after this that's podcast. That's going into the CD player in White Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, what a great interview. Yeah. What a great interview. Yeah, yeah. And again, congratulations to Paul on yeah. his book, which won uh, the yeah. award for Book of the Year. I think it was 2021. Exactly. The award yeah. ceremony was delayed yeah. a little bit, yeah. but uh, and, no. Yeah, and the book is Ar- Irish Securities Law, and I think it's published by Bloomsbury Publishing. Yes. Yeah. So before we go, I'd also like to say a big thank you to our producer, Conal O'Moroin, and to Lee Brennan of the Dublin South Podcast Studios for recording this show. And so from me, Peter Leonard. And myself, Mark Tottenham. Thank you for listening, and we shall see you soon in the Fifth Court. 